Hi everyone and welcome to part two of how a narcissist deals with death. So in part one we covered how a narcissist will deal when you're grieving for your loved one, how they'll deal with death in that manner. And today as promised we're going to look at when the narcissist loses a loved one in inverted commas. Someone who would be classified as uh, in a close relationship with the narcissist who they express grief over losing. So there are two elements to this. There are two aspects um, and we're going to cover both uh, in the first and second half. In relation to how narcissists act in different situations, it is very useful to understand that their behavior is extremely predictable. And the advantage of it being predictable, even though there are variations, are usually due to the intellectual level and positioning in society. But there are patterns of behavior where you can predict in relation to the control element of how they control people, you can predict how they're going to react in situations. And that is essentially what narcissists do with other human beings who have empathy. They predict that they'll get an emotional reaction if they go about things in a certain way. So the point of saying this is, one, the predictability of the behavior is very useful in self-diagnosing if that's the only option we have in saying that that person is likely a narcissist observing their behavior and going on the criteria of the dsm-5 because narcissists will rarely go to therapy unless there is an advantage to it and um, secondly if you have to have a relationship with a narcissist if they're familial or you know, you have to work with someone or you have to co-parent with a narcissist. If you understand how they're going to react to an action you may take, then you can change that action to get a different reaction. So that's why even if you're well over narcissists, it's a great idea to be able to recognize the likelihood of a person being a narcissist and then changing your behavior towards that person to to get a more favorable result for what you're looking to achieve so i just wanted to put that in there because i think this education is fascinating and i think it's very valuable and useful in, in basically getting your needs met and damage limitation where narcissists are concerned so how does the narcissist deal with the death of someone they believe they love or know that they don't, but someone who is a very good source of narcissistic supply in that they service the narcissist in all areas or they emotionally react continually to the narcissist's triggering of them and totally believe in the narcissist mask and therefore empower the narcissist in their fake persona and the fake presentation. And once they empower the narcissist in the fake presentation, the narcissist feels very well defended and very well capable of offending and basically feels the false persona is working and they believe in it more commensurate with the other person believing in their fake mask. So the two sides of the coin in relation to how the narcissist views someone dying Again, like in the other podcast, they view it as an inconvenience. Now, obviously, they can't go around expressing that's damn inconvenient that that loved one of mine died and it's really caused me a lot of problems. <laughs> that's not going to go down very well and it's not going to achieve their aims. But death is something that even a narcissist can't control. So they feel a threat to their control by the fact that someone has gone and died on them. They feel anger towards their inability to control it. And anger is in a way 
trying to get control of the situation. So it's an expression that you'll often see coming out of a narcissist when someone dies that was meant to be their loved one and it perplexes us. Not to confuse any of the things I'm talking about now or reactions to death, you know, as saying being able to pinpoint, oh, that person got really angry, didn't want to talk, you know, was very upset. Obviously, that doesn't make them a narcissist. There are a variety of reasons that people will react in a variety of ways to the death of a loved one. The behaviours described here have got to go hand in hand with the package of what a narcissist is in lack of accountability, lack of empathy, a grandiose sense of self, self-referencing and always being right. So just bear that in mind. But these criteria can also be useful in, in a comprehensive look at the person overall. So they see the loved one dying as a betrayal of them, an inconvenience. They were expecting that person to maybe perform some tasks for them in the future. They had maybe an agreement. They were in a relationship that was self-serving and that person was providing their needs beautifully hadn't a clue they were dealing with a narcissist and were just trying to help said narcissist improve their lives, etc. So they're angry at the world and they're angry at the audacity of their loved one passing on. It's causing them a huge inconvenience. And what they will do is they'd often kind of say, if they'd only listened to me, you know, I told them to go to the doctor. I used to tell them to do this and to do that. But would they listen? No, no, they wouldn't listen. So in other words, they're even they're even actually trying to blame the person for dying and that if the person had listened to them, they wouldn't be dead. It's that crazy when they're trying to express or put their control over the situation. They're trying to express their anger at the other person because the other person has wronged them in their eyes. Remember, this is very black and white thinking. There is no gray area where the narcissist is concerned. So in order to put control on the person or over the person that's let them down and betrayed them and lacked loyalty in having gone and died on them, they will put accountability on the person as being at fault for not listening to them and therefore the result of that was that the person died. This is one of the ways they can deal with the death of a loved one. They'll also speak about themselves a lot. They'll self-reference a lot when they're talking about their loved one in inverted commas having passed on and say, what am I going to do now? You know, I used to, I used to ring them every Thursday night and and they'll cry and they'll, you know, they'll, they'll show a lot of grief because they're feeling very sorry for themselves. And it does appear that the grief is authentic because they are actually experiencing loss. But it's not so much for the beautiful spirit and soul of the person that has passed on and thinking about their life and their meaning as a person and the reference, you know, for the other members of the family that are going to lose this person and thinking about them and how they're going to cope with the loss. It's all about the narcissist and how the narcissist is going to cope. And when that person's not there, when the narcissist usually would have had a communication with them, it's very upsetting. So they do feel the loss, but it's self pity more than a loss or honoring of the person that passed on. Because if we remember, people are tools to enable the narcissist to emotionally regulate themselves. And I remember at the beginning of the education in relation to narcissism, so what does emotional regulation mean? You know, so I emotionally regulate the other person. And it essentially means that without the interaction, emotional interaction with another person, 
There is no life in the body of the narcissist. If you remember that what they're putting up to the world is a false mask, a false persona, and it's got loads of different character traits attached that they perceived were effective to control other people. So if they developed a talent or if they developed a certain look that they saw worked for other people in getting attention and that other person was able to get people to do things for them, they will attach or try and attach similar character traits. They'll copy other people's talents and put it on this mask. So in order for the mask to work, other people have to believe it. And in order for it to be believable, the mask has to be able to make somebody else react emotionally, like in a live way to what this mask does. Then the mask gets switched on, it's real, and the inner, true inner self can believe that it's real. And therefore, it is the psychological protective mechanism that has been coined by psychologists to protect the inner self with all the badness that it does. In any case, I digress. Basically, this is the, the poor side of the one side of the coin when the narcissist loses their loved one. It's very self-referencing. It makes the narcissist angry. It's very inconvenient. And in order for them to put control over the situation, they have to go through this range of emotions and talk to people about it and how it's affecting them and what the person should have listened to, et cetera, et cetera. The other side of the coin is particularly with a narcissist who may be experiencing this for the first time or the second time as always, narcissists are highly opportunistic. They have to be because they have to always go searching for their food, water and emotional regulation, so to speak. They cannot self-regulate. So any opportunity that affords them attention, services, control over other people and therefore emotional regulation and empowerment of themselves and their mask is going to be used and manipulated and obviously around a time of a funeral or a passing of a person people get together there is for want of a better way to describe it it is a dramatic situation there are, are heightened emotions life stops in general and there's a concentration on the people that are at the, the person's passing, the funeral or the wake or whatever you use as a term for that occurrence. So it's like a nucleus of very potent narcissistic supply. And the narcissist attene literally go, boing, this is good. This is a situation that I will thrive in. And again, that's kind of heinous to us because as normal human beings, you look to support each other, to share your grief, to show empathy and feel empathy and to mark and honor the passing of someone you've loved. The narcissist gets elated by this circumstance. The narcissist will use it to the hilt for attention they may be go into hysteria crying. They may look like they can't cope. Um, they will even sometimes form a pathetic looking person so that everybody will rush to their service. Um, they may tend to fall as they come into the church, uh, you know, that they can't sit up straight that they're so distraught at, at this event that they need extra support and a lot of attention. Or they can present with the brave stony face where they show no emotion whatsoever. And I don't get this confused with a stoic person who is proud and who grieves in private. They will present in the best way for the crowd 
that they're meeting with at the funeral service. So if the hyster hysteria or the patheticness or the poor me, I need to help hold my arm and support me, if that's not the, doesn't fit in well with the genre of people that are there, they will be stoic and brave and come across as proud and take people's condolences and say, you know, I have to go through this. Yes, it is a terrible thing. Thank you for your support. I would appreciate your support going forward. So they can present in a few different ways. But the main point I'm saying is they will use the opportunity to interact with other people in getting the most narcissistic supply from them at the event. Now, having gone through that, they have to work hard. If this person has been a close compatriot or family member or spouse or sibling of the narcissist or friend that's always there for them, they have to work quickly on role replacement. And this again is an inconvenience for the narcissist particularly if they weren't expecting, if it was a sudden death of a loved one. So you often find with narcissists, nearly a week after the funeral or the passing of the person, they're on the dating sites, they're going out, they're looking for, for other people, they're anyone that's offered them a lot of sympathy at the passing, you know, of the, at the funeral service or whatever, will be hooked onto and roped in as a replacement friend, as a supporter. And oftentimes this, will, this occasion will be milked for months to come where the narcissist presents as being so grief stricken that they're unable to function, they're unable to work, they need financial support to get them through this. It'll also be used as a way of excusing bad behavior. So if they start raging and shouting at someone um, because they're lacking supply and they haven't maybe replaced the person as yet, they will say, please excuse me, you know, if necessary, in an apology, if the, the person walks out on them. It's just that I'm still grieving. I'm still grieving. Now, what the narcissist is grieving for is the loss of supply and the fact that they haven't been able to quickly enough replace that source of supply and they need to emotionally regulate themselves. So they need to cause drama or an emotional reaction in the person that they're interacting with and therefore raging at them and getting a lot of reaction from them and then being able to use, you know, that as an excuse, they're grieving as an excuse to bring the person back to them, the push and the pull, all serves the narcissist very well. And that is essentially how the narcissist is coping with their grief in inverted commas. When that slipper is worn out, when the time has passed and people are getting fed up with making excuses for the narcissist and their so-called grief. The narcissist may then come back to performance, their daily normal performance. You may also see them jumping into a new relationship very quickly after the passing of the other person. And people are astounded at this and can't believe it and are see it as a bit of a red flag about the person and you know are questioning it and even referencing it to the narcissist this is what the narcissist will do the narcissist will say look you guys you know i had to move on with my life i know i was expecting too much from you and you know i was I was in a bad place and you were all very good to me, but I know you were saying I needed to move on and et cetera, et cetera. So I've taken the bull by the horns. I'm still really grieving, but I decided I had to pull myself out of this and I had to move on. 
There's another thing that they will do, two more things I have here on the list that they will do. They will concentrate on securing the inheritance from that person that they had, be, if there is an inheritance in the offing, that they had been working on getting. So you may have seen a narcissist opportunistically targeting a single elderly person or um, really enhancing their relationship with a parent who was poorly, who was dying, and they will be wanting to cash in on their investment on that relationship very quickly after the person has died. Or they will fight tooth and nail if they have been left out of a will, you know, and the other family members are doing better than them, they'll fight tooth and nail to get their share of the spondulas. So that's what another thing they'll do. And the last thing I have here on the list that they will do is following on from them maybe entering a new relationship very quickly and explaining to people that the reason that they're doing this is because everybody was getting annoyed at them or P-I-S-S-E-D off at them, you know, for being so needy and wanting so many services, finances given to them, you know, time given to them, meals brought to them, you know, the, the picture and leave down in the, in the comments if you've experienced this, please. Some narcissists will actually go out on the town. Some narcissists will actually go out on the town and party quite soon or even at the time the person has passed on. Now, this is sometimes a knee jerk reaction of people who just cannot, you know, accept the shock of their loved one dying and their modus operandi is to go and get drunk or high or whatever people do as an escapism. So again, we don't diagnose on one action that, the, oh, that person's a narcissist because they did that. Obviously, I know I'm simplifying this a lot, but it is necessary to, it is very necessary to be pretty responsible about coming to the conclusion that anybody may be a narcissist. So they'll go out and party. And if anybody holds them accountable for this, they will say, I couldn't cope with the loss. And this is my way of coping. And the loss is so hard to take. I need to get out of it. I need to, I can't cope with this at the moment. And that's why I was out partying. Now, they're out partying because they have no empathy for the person they've lost. They may be looking for a new supply by going out partying, but they're definitely, or they may be celebrating an inheritance. They'll definitely re-reference the fact that that's a really bad thing to do in terms of normality, I suppose. Sure, it may help some people, and I'm sure a lot of us may have reacted in that way at some point in our lives, but it is an unusual reaction to somebody who's really grieving the loss of a loved one. Probably would, would happen more with younger people. I don't know, I don't want to generalize, but if a narcissist is called to account over doing something like that or continually doing it, not just doing it, say, for one evening, but raving up for a week or more after the death of a loved one, they will excuse it. So basically, the death of a narcissist loved one is a great opportunity for a narcissist to gain narcissistic supply and extra services and extra sympathy and empathy from human beings who are normal and who normally regulate themselves. The narcissist will use the occasion to totally self-reference in relation to how the death of their loved one has affected them and 
they will be lacking in empathy for anyone else affected by the death because they have to be the chief griever. Nobody else is feeling the death as badly as them. And in a way that may be true if that person has been a major source of narcissistic supply to the said narcissist. So guys, I hope that was of some type of insight into what to expect from a narcissist when one of their family members die. And again, when you reference how they take the death of someone in their family or a spouse or a friend, their loss is going to be huge and is going to need a lot of attention, a huge amount of attention. It's going to, to need a huge amount of you putting out for the narcissist. It's going to be used as an excuse for bad behavior on the narcissist's part. Whereas when you had a loss in your family, it would be poo-pooed. You'd be told to move on. You'd be told, well, that person wasn't all that anyway. And when you have the loss of a loved one in your family, the narcissist will say, will again self-reference if they have to talk to you about your loss. They'll say, well, I lost my mother or my father or my brother or my wife or whatever, a husband. And the reason my loss was so much worse than yours was, and they list off different things. So basically they'll say, you know, your mum wasn't so great to you. I mean, I had an amazing one. So, you know, I think that you should put things in perspective and just move on. It is amazing how what's good for the narcissist is not good for you and vice versa. So it's always going to be about them grabbing the energy, grabbing the services, being disingenuous, having no empathy, and just utilizing everything about them in a parasitic way. And it is essential if you are with a narcissist to move out of that energy field and protect yourself because, and that's what I'm going to talk about in the next podcast, is about energy, is about spiritualism, is about dealing practically with narcissistic people and why it is not a good idea to spend a lot of time around them. So goodbye for now from Manhattan. The next podcast will more than likely come from Ireland unless I have time to make one before I leave here. Uh, thank you all for being here. I don't say that often enough. And just a little bit of news. Um, actually, a client of mine said that I should mention this. I have completed the writing of a book. The It's the first book I'm going to write. The second book is going to be about healing. The first book describes the basics of narcissism, how they operate, why they operate as they do, interspersed with my own personal experience. I am at the moment going through the whole process. I would like to publish traditionally. If I can't get anyone interested enough, I will self-publish and I will let you know the details on this channel. I'm not going to mention it again for a while. I'm in the process of contacting literary agents, which is a whole new world. If anyone has any experience of that, please let me know. Or if anybody knows of a publisher in the genre that we're dealing with here in this community, I would love for them to send me that information. And the my email is narxcon at gmail.com. It's spelled N-A-O-R-C-S-C-O-N at gmail.com. More will follow. Thank you.